You guys uh, like movies? I like movies. Uh, I'm a little bit of a nerd, so just bear with me here. But uh, I love, I, I know, I know, I know. It doesn't, I don't even have to say it. Uh, just, it's all over my face. Nerd right here, okay? I get it. Uh, but uh, I love the Lord of the Rings movies. If you haven't seen it, I don't judge you. God does. Uh, no, I'm teasing. In every movie, like, let me just put it into perspective. I've never seen the Godfather movies. I've never seen any of the Rambo movies. I've never seen any of the Rocky movies, okay? But I've seen every Lord of the Rings movie like a million times. In fact, I don't recommend this. I don't recommend this. But I, when the box sets came out for Christmas one year, I literally called in sick from work. <laughs> And I watched all of them. I watched the How They Made It first, which was like four DVDs. And then I would watch the two DVD movies. Yeah, some of you don't even... DVDs? What? A-Track, okay? That's, it's the A-Track for the new generation, okay? But in every long series of movies, there's always that one movie that you're like, okay, that was cool. Uh, some cool scenes in that, uh, but you know, it wasn't like the first one. And then you see the second one, and you're like, oh, I see, I see what the purpose of that middle movie was. It was kind of like the bridge, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's chapter two in the book of Ruth. <laughs> I'm just, I'm setting expectations here, okay? I got a great lesson for you because God's word is God's word. Yeah. And it's got stuff in there for us all the time that's amazing, amen? Yeah. But sometimes there are just certain chapters that it's like, man, this one just flat hit me in the gut. And other times you're like, wow, that's, that's cool. That, that's cool, you know? And you kind of go, okay, cool, cool. That's chapter two, amen? Amen. You know, last week, one of the key themes in the passage that we read was Proverbs 14, 12, which is, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. Today, we're going to dive into another theme that's Proverbs 16, 9. Write that down. It says, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. We can make plans. We can do what we feel that we need to do, but God will establish our way. His way will always prevail in our lives. And I don't know if you've like heard that through all the speaking that's been done so far, the hand of God in every person's life in one way or another. And I want you all to know, there's a reason why you came here. It wasn't because you have family that's here. It wasn't because some random family member invited you to Thanksgiving, invited you. What, that, that, that's not why you're here. You're here because God ordained for you to be here for this specific Sunday so that you can make decisions in your life that will greatly affect your relationship with Him. Amen? God is moving in this story in the book of Ruth, and he's moving in your story, and he's moving in my story, even in the daily grind. That's the title of our lesson this morning, A Godly Hand in the Daily Grind. Ruth chapter 1, verse 22, we wrapped up our service with this passage. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And again, sometimes you got to read this in different translations because the way the different, uh, uh, not writers of the Bible, but translators of the Bible make things more readable, uh, they kind of, not they don't take anything out, but they just change a little bit of, of, of the way that it's been worded so that you can understand the meaning a little bit better. But as the barley harvest was beginning, has a note in it, if you read it in more of a, a, a literal translation of, it just so happened that they came back during the barley harvest. And wouldn't you know it, the barley harvest was just beginning. Now for us, we're like, barley harvest, okay. Like, barley, okay, great. Maybe you came from an ag background, we are in the Central Valley, so you're like, hey, that's kind of cool, that's significant. You don't understand. You're right. Most people don't understand. But the fact that you do is awesome. 
But oftentimes we can feel like our dis- the decisions that we make in our lives have, have really no consequence. Then, oh, okay, barley harvest, great. They, they get some food. I mean, that's awesome, you know. They, they can get some bread, you know. Or that we've been left to our own devices this side of heaven and the things that we do just have no real meaning. But as we will see, God's hand is working behind the scenes. Even in the mundane, everyday situations that we find, in our daily grind, God is working. Let's read Ruth chapter 2 together. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and pick up the leftover grain behind everyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of the harvest, whose young woman this belongs to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained from here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in any other field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whether you are thirsty, go and drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told about all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you've left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. I have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to the men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks from her, for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and do not rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth, was brought, Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today was Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. He added, she added, That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finished harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Amen. So today, we're going to look at a man of standing, a woman of character, and the hand of God in their lives. Amen? Amen. So let's start with this man of standing. In chapter 1, we read, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, my brothers, you got to pay attention to this guy. He's a good model of the kind of man that you and I should be. Amen? And sisters, pay attention. This is the kind of man you want to marry. Might even be the man you already married. You know what I mean? Maybe. 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 That's not for me to know. 
Now, we've already discussed in last week's lesson that names in the Bible have significance. And as we see here, we have a man of standing, but that's not what his name means. The name Boaz has a few meanings. One of them is quickness. Another is in the strength of or in him is strength or to be strong. So we know this guy was strong. We know that somehow he got this name of Boaz, meaning to be strong and to be quick. But his reputation is as a man of standing. That's what the NIV says. An influential man, another translation says, a worthy man, a man of wealth, a man of great wealth, a man of wealth and influence, a prominent man of noble character, a mighty man of excellence, and a mighty man of valor, just to name a few of the different translations that you can find. The term here, standing, though, is most translated elsewhere in the Bible as a heroic man, a man of valor, a brave man. So we're not just dealing with some rich, whiny dude who owned a field. We're dealing with a legitimate man of standing, an influential man, a man of noble character. He had this reputation in the community, and it made its way into the Bible. This man happened to be a relative of Naomi, and that was he from, from the clan of Elimelech. Now, we don't know what, nobody knows what kind of relationship, maybe it was a distant cousin or, you know, something like that, but we know that they were related, which is an important aspect, and we'll look at that next week. Our first encounter with this man is that he greets his workers in the fields. Chapter 2, verse 4, just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Now, this, isn't, this is a classic standard greeting in Hebrew culture, but what it does is it shows us the kind of man that he is, the kind of employer he is. Mm. Psalm 129, go ahead and turn there. This isn't just your casual greeting. You know, oftentimes we can read Psalms, we can read through the Bible, and we can kind of go, oh, that's cool, you know, this is awesome. But we can miss sometimes the significance of who wrote it and the relationships to certain people in their past. How many of you have sayings? I'm reminded of this whenever I go home uh, because I say a lot of the things that my dad used to say. And when I'm, when I'm with my own family, I just kind of say it, you know what I mean? When, when I'm with, you know, Ariel's family, we spent the, 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 you know, a good chunk of the week with Ariel's family, and uh, that was awesome. And even Ariel was reminded based on some of the things that her brother-in-law would say or their kids would say. It's like, I remember when Josh would say that to my mom, you know what I mean? So oftentimes we can pass down these words, these phrases in our own lives because that's what our parents said, good or bad, amen, okay? But it's kind of interesting. Psalm 129, look here in verse 1. They have greatly oppressed me from my youth, let Israel say. They have greatly oppressed me from my youth, but they have not gained the victory over me. Plowmen have plowed my back and made their furrows long, but the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be turned back in shame. May they be like grass on the roof, which withers before it can grow. A reaper cannot fill his hand with it, nor one who gathers fill his arms. May those who pass by not say to them, the blessing of the Lord be on you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Now what's interesting is while this psalm was written years and years and years later by, uh, by Boaz's great-great-grandson David, I can't help but think that maybe David had in mind an old saying from his great-great-grandfather that had been passed down. Because if you look at the, the, the way that he's communicating, it's almost as if he's looking back to the time of the judges, back to the time when before God would raise up a leader in Israel to help his people get back to righteousness, that they were oppressed. And people would come and take their grain and take their, their stock because they were oppressed. He's like, it got so bad, don't even say the Lord bless you. 
Don't even say, may God bless you. But here he's saying the exact opposite because why? God has come and raised up a judge. God has come and lifted the curse. God has come and delivered his people. And so I don't believe personally that this was just some random greeting. I think he literally is looking forward in the sands of time, looking back in the sands of time and going, God is good. God is good. Look at this harvest. We didn't have this a year ago. We didn't have this two years ago. But God has indeed rescued his people. And this is exactly what he says and exactly what those who work for him respond. So the first we see is that he is a godly master, a godly employer. He's a great man of value because he has great value and he values others. See, value follows value. You will give value to something that you believe is valuable. Right? It is Special Mission Sunday, and if you value the kingdom, then you're going to show that value of the kingdom by giving what you value. Your relationships that you value, they get your time, they get your attention, they get your treasure. And so here with God's. Whether we are an employer or an employee, do we make this much care? Do we show this much care to those that we lead? To those that we care for in the workplace? Or maybe to our customers? Maybe to our fellow employees? Now, it's kind of probably not necessarily a It wouldn't be a bad thing, but maybe it's a little weird to say, God bless you. I mean, we do that when people sneeze, you know what I mean? (laughs) People will accept the blessing of God when you sneeze, but you start talking about church and Jesus and like, ah, don't. I don't want none of that. You were cool with it when you sneezed, but now you're not okay with it? It doesn't make any sense. But we know that Boaz was a man of standing. We know that he was a great godly man, a great godly employer, which is awesome. And then Boaz takes notice of this new woman in his fields. Now, what I find interesting is if you notice in verse 2, Ruth says, Let me go in the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Have you ever thought something and then God made it happen? Like you didn't even pray for it. It was just a thought. I remember... Praying, not praying, but thinking, this is the kind of woman I want. I want a woman who can dress like grubby, we're going to go out and hike, or we're going to do, you know, we're going to, like, we can, we can go out and go camping, and then literally come home, get changed, and go to a five-star restaurant the next, you know, the next hour. Okay, Ariel. Okay, sis. Didn't even pray about it. I just thought it. Long, long time ago. And what did God give me? Bam. And we've done it a few times. We've done it a few times. And it's been awesome. This is the hand of God. Knowing what our heart's desires are. That maybe we're even afraid to ask him. And yet, what does he do? He gives us that desire. Ruth chapter 2 verse 5 says, Boaz asked the overseer of the harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? He walks up to her in verse 8 and says, My daughter, listen to me. Do not go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. So there's some protection going on here. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Here things start to get a little bit interesting. He is under no obligation to do anything for this woman, family or not. No obligation. She is a Moabite, which we already looked at that last week. A widow of a man who disobeyed God. A man who abandoned his family land in Judah and died in shame in Moab. Yet here is Boaz providing protection and freedom to glean in peace. Chapter 2, verse 11, it says, I've been told. Why would he do this? I've been told about all what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland. That's a significant sentence. And again, we looked at this last week. She literally left everything. She left everything 
to go to a place where people literally hate her guts. She is an enemy of God. She is a reminder of all things enemy to God. The land under a curse. And she said, you know what? I would rather get treated poorly under God's house than go back to where I came. This is why Boaz took notice of her. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. You know, what's interesting is that Boaz would be the one, would be the hand of God in repaying her. Not just in what we see in chapter 2, but in beyond. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Circle that, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. We're going to get into that a little bit later on tomorrow, next week. Again, why would Boaz take notice of her? Just another poor woman gleaning in a field. I think God opened his eyes. Because he's got a lot of women that are working for him. But there's this new girl, you know what I mean? Well, all right. Come on, guys, you know this. Gals, you know this. You go to school, you know what I mean? And you got the, you got the new kid in school. You're like, oh, all right. The, the new guy at work, you know what I mean? You're like, oh. Now, if he's not a disciple, you're like, oh, amen, I got to help him out. <laughs> you know, we were uh, with the Martinos last week, last Sunday, and we we're kind of reading through and, and talking about the lesson from last week and kind of getting into chapter two, and Ariel had an interesting insight of why would he know this information? Why would he know what's going on? Now, obviously, there's the scuttle, you know, that's going around, the, the information, the, the, the grapevine, you know what I mean? But Ariel's like, no, he's keeping tabs on her. He's keeping tabs on what's going on in the family. You know, it's always awesome to come back from the holidays and you learn about all that's going on in the family, you know what I mean? You, you learn things you don't even want to know. You're like, I didn't want to know that, uh, but now I do, and I got to get that out of my head but he was keeping tabs. He was a close relative. He was checking in, listening to what Ruth was doing in Israel. Now, he hadn't seen her. Otherwise, he wouldn't have asked the question. You know what I mean? But he had heard all that God had done through her to ease the the conscience and ease the mind of Naomi and how she is trying to protect Naomi, her mother-in-law. How she left her own country She had turned back on her old life, turned back on her old gods. Though her new life looked dismal and hopeless. She knew what her great-great-grandson David would say in Psalm 84, verse 10, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Boaz saw the character and the integrity of this woman and rewarded her for it. Look in verse 15. And she got up to glean. Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stocks for her from the bundles and and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. How many times is the word her in this? A lot. So he is singling her out. What about all the other gleaners? I mean, think if you were one of the other gals out there gleaning, you know what I mean? Like, what? Why is she getting preferential treatment? What did did she ask for? In whose eyes I find favor. And God is behind it. My single brothers, is this you? Our dear sisters have left the world behind. They've turned back on their gods. Albeit... They have probably a lot of ungodly prospects out there that they've turned their backs on too. You know, I have a deep conviction. My brother-in-law, I remember I came, moved to California uh, before I became a disciple, and I was struggling with going out on dates. I'm like, doggone it, man. Why do I got to spend all this money and like take these sisters out? And I'm like, just, man. Don't make fun. Some of y'all are right there. Some of y'all right there. I'm like, I just, I just want to like, I just want to be alone. You know what I mean? I just want to read my books. I want to go to the bookstore and just chill. You know what I mean? Like, like, why, why? 
And my brother-in-law told me a story. He's like, you know what, there's this one sister who, you know, parables are the best, you know what I mean? My brother-in-law can weave a really nice parable. He goes, he says, this one sister who um, was faithful in all, she quiet time, blah, 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 all these things. Great, awesome sister. And, uh, and, but no brothers in her ministry would take her out on dates. And we in the church have what are called encouragement dates. And so the dates that we do are a little different than the ones in the world where, you, you know, you're kind of like, okay, well, does he like me? Does he not like me? You're like, you're spending the whole time on edge. You know what I mean? That's not how we do it. We build a relationship based on friendship. And if God makes it more than that, it's awesome. If he doesn't, you got a homie. It's awesome. You got a homie. And it's even awesomer if, that's a word, I'm just coining that right. It's even more awesome when your homie becomes your wife. True. Or your homie becomes your husband. You know what I'm saying? So she's telling me, he's telling me all this, like she's just, da, da, ba, 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 this, she's serving this way, da, 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 da. just this amazing, amazing gal. And, uh, and so nobody would take her on a dates. And so she's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to you know, go on a sister date. You know what I mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to serve this person. I'm going to go and do, 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 all these different things. But deep down inside, she began to feel insecure. She began to feel sad. She began to feel uh, discouraged. Like maybe there's something wrong with me. And Satan just started to just throw the arrows, like just boom, 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 boom. You know, just taking it. And as time went on, she started, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to take the brothers out. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm going to be an example. Taking this brother out, taking this brother out, building great friendships, it's awesome. But still, no brothers. This is a super unspiritual group, just super unspiritual. I started to get angry. I'm like, just, you, you guys know that? That, that, that feeling that just kind of wells up? You're just like, don't, don't, I'm glad, I'm glad you're saying that this happened back in your day because if, because I'd be hurting some people, you know what I mean? And so he goes on, and, and finally, there was this guy at her work that took notice of her. Great guy, good looking, strong, you know, wealthy, had it all put together, driving a nice car, owned his own home. This was in Long Beach, California at the time. So, you know what I mean? It was good stuff, you know what I mean? And she started like, hey, let's, let's go get some lunch. Or, hey, you know, just not even hitting on her, right? Not even like unclassy, but like being classy, you know what I mean? And she like... You know, at first, sisters, you, you, you've done this before, right? Where you're kind of like, yeah, hey, no, I, I, got, I, got something to, I got something to do. You know, I'm busy, da 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 Because you're not trying to go, you're not a Christian, so I'm not dating you. <laughs> right? You're trying to, like, soft pedal it a little bit. Now, I think we should stop doing that and just go, hey, you need to come to my church. Then we'll talk about it. You know what I mean? Oh, come on. But he kept at it. He kept at it. He kept at it. And finally, just like, she comes home and she's just crying She's crying in her bed. She's just so discouraged. And the brothers are just so selfish. And I just, I don't get, that's not what she said, but that's what I'm saying right now. You know what I mean? But what was awesome is that she never, ever, ever gave in to Satan's temptation. But he, he, he looks at me and says, how do you feel right now? I'm like, I want to hurt somebody. We're some brothers. We're some brothers, man. And he goes, what would you do? What would you do if you were in that ministry with those brothers? Wow. And you found out that, that that sister was actually your sister, Ooh. your real sister. I'd be like, what? It was locked in, just, you know, like, like locked in. I'm like, I'm, I'm handling the business. And I, uh, I have never, ever failed to have a weekend up to that point or after that point that I did not take a sister out on dates. So much so that before I met Ariel, I moved to Orange County, California, and the brothers were not taking sisters out on dates. They were playing video games on Saturday nights, going out to Top Golf, you know what I mean? Just doing their thing. And I remember I came down to Orange County, and I would take three sisters out on dates. I have a Friday night, I have a Saturday night, and I take a sister out to lunch on Sunday. It was my, now, I was single, I had an awesome job, I could afford that. Brothers, amen. One, once a week, amen. But these brothers started getting mad at me. Like, bro, what's your problem? I'm like, what's your problem? 
What do you mean, what's my problem? It's like, bro, you're making us look bad. I was like, no, you look bad. You guys are despicable. I remember I got a chance to preach to the guys. It was not a pretty sight. But I had a deep conviction. Our sisters deserve protection. Our sisters deserve us to take care of them. How would it be if that was your sister, my brothers? How would it be if that was your brother, my sister? See, the cool thing about becoming a disciple is that we turn our backs on the world. Prospects are slim. Because anybody can say they're a Christian. Anybody, like 85% of Americans claim Christianity. Show me your life and I'll tell you whether you're a Christian or not. How dare you tell me whether I'm a Christian? The Bible says I can. Because I put this next to your life and it says you're not. Or it says you are. Or it says you might be, so let's dig a little deeper. So it says you are or you aren't. It's not just because I'm a pastor. It's not just because I get up here and preach on a Sunday. It's because I have the very words of God that show whether you are or are not. The Bible says the acts of the flesh are obvious. It is not hard. Even in this room, I could pinpoint a disciple or a non-disciple. It's not difficult for me. And that's love. Because why would I stand up here and sugarcoat the truth so that you can feel better about yourself walking out that door today? My brothers and sisters, this is a way that we take care of the family of God. And if this is not your deep conviction, then I would question whether you actually have made the decision to actually protect the family of God by being a true disciple. Or maybe, like Anthony so shared, you become lukewarm. You become lukewarm in your conviction. Oh, I'm too old. It doesn't matter. It's not an issue of age. Do you care about your brothers and sisters? I'm too young. It's not an issue of age. Well, they're more spiritual. Who cares? (laughs) Go out with a more spiritual brother or sister and get more spiritual. (laughs) Boaz had a deep conviction. He not only took care of the women that were in his field, Because I guarantee you, he wasn't like, hey, I've instructed the guys not to touch you, but they can touch the rest of the ladies. That's not the Boaz that we're seeing here. He wouldn't have been a man of standing. He'd be a man of hypocrisy, which is our religious world, which is the men in our religious worlds. Let me tell you, I claim to be a Christian. I claim to be a Christian growing up, and I can guarantee you I did not have Boaz's heart with with women in my life. Guarantee you. But we need to be like this. Amen? Come on, bro. This will be shown in the quality and the quantity of the encouragement dates that you and I go on. This man was indeed a man of standing, as we will learn more about him next week. But my brothers, there's a lot we can learn by studying this man, Boaz. And my sisters, there is a lot that you can learn about a godly man by studying out this man, Boaz, as well. Now, Let's talk about a woman of character. And my sisters, pay attention to this woman because she's a model of the great kind of woman that I know you want to be. And my brothers, this is the kind of woman you want to marry. Amen? Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. We looked at this before. But think about this scene for a moment. Ruth is a widow. She's left her homeland, Moab, to move into a country to where she would be viewed as a stranger, as a foreigner. In fact, she calls herself that many, many times. Her mother-in-law, who is also a widow herself, but she's given all that up in order to have God. Ruth, however, in all of this, was not inclined to just sit and just kind of wallow in her own self-pity. Well, you've got nothing going on. I got a bitter old woman over here. You know, I'm just a, you know, just, I, I got nothing. I'm a Moabite. People are talking smack about me. She did not just sit and lick her wounds. She got to work. Wow. And she did. You know, by the way, we've mentioned the word gleaning and the gleaning part of this. So what is gleaning? Go to Leviticus 19. What is this gleaning in the fields? What, what's the significance of this? Leviticus 19, look here in verse 9. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, 
Do not reap to the very edges of your fields or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. This is a command of God to take care of the poor and needy in your land. Flip a couple pages to Leviticus 23, verse 22 repeats this. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. Why would he end with, I am the Lord your God? He ends it to say, this is how it should be done. This is God's welfare plan. The poor were, being, were to be able to go and pick the extra fruit and the grain from the harvest. I mean, if you drive around Central Valley, and many of you will on your way home, wherever you go, you're going to see fields that have been plowed, fields that have been uh, overturned all the way to the edges. Does this happen today? No. no. We don't. It doesn't happen today. And it doesn't happen today because we have governmental programs that take care of us. And amen for that. I think that's necessary to some degree. But that was not God's original intention, was that you and I would sit back and receive a check every month or a check every two weeks. It was to go and work. Now, God would provide it. God would have the grain grow. God would have the grapes there. But you had to go out and do the work in order to get it. You know, I appreciate Tierra coming up here last Sunday and sharing her contribution. It was phenomenal, right? What was one of the things she said? Like, yeah, I, I, I'm getting unemployment, but I can't just sit back and get it. I got to get a side hustle going. And I got this and I got that and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And what did God do? Provided her an opportunity to blow out missions. Not just that, but I guarantee you God has provided her a way to have all of her needs get met. Why? Because she was willing to put in the work. Willing to put in the work. You know, many people, again, want to sit back and collect checks from the government or to get handouts from others, and we should be taking care of others. So don't hear what I'm not saying. But this was not God's original plan. God gave a way to help, but those who were in need had an obligation to put in the labor to get it. And those who were providing were expected to trust God. Well, man, I mean, if I, if I leave the edge, how much is an edge? Is it just like one row? Or, or is it a couple rows? Like, what does that look like? No, just the edge. The edge. Yeah, but I mean, it's such a, it's such a hard crop this season. I mean, like, I mean, think about it. They just was a famine. There was literally just a famine the year before. So I, I, if I'm smart, I'm going, okay, I'm thinking ahead. What about the next famine? Maybe I need, to, I need to glean a little further in so that, so that I've got a n plenty left over in case something happens. There's always going to be an in case something happens. But what's crazy is that we trust God. I am the Lord your God, he says, meaning trust me. Don't go to the edge. Don't go back over your field. Don't go back over your vineyard. Just leave it. Just leave it and let God handle the rest. Obey my plan and you will be rewarded. Over and over and over in the scriptures we see that. So this isn't just about gleaning for the, the poor people. This was a test of the hearts of the wealthy. The hearts of the people who were doing well. Are you going to take matters into your own hands and glean to the edge? Are you going to pick up? Wow, that's a rip. I shouldn't have dropped that doggone thing of grapes. That looks huge. Those are perfect. Ah, okay, all right. Trust in God. Isn't this what God expects from you and I in our giving? We give so that others cannot just survive physically, which all of our churches do. We help out our communities, physical needs, but also, more importantly, their spiritual needs, which the Bedoyas shared with us. There is a great deception in the midst of God's church today that says, take care of your own and then take care of everybody else. That's not God's economy. God's economy is we take care of one another. 
and we trust God to provide. Amen? Amen. Back to Ruth. How did she find out about this gleaning, by the way? She read her Bible. The only way she would have known, there's no indication in here that Naomi said, hey, go and glean. No, it was Ruth's idea. So whether she heard about it or whether she read it, one way or the other, she found out about it. It was her idea. This was her John 8, 31, 32 moment. John 8, 31, 32 says, The Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. She understood that the intellectual decision that she made to leave her gods, to leave her old family, to leave her old life was not enough. She actually had to obey the Bible. Wow, come on. And for you and I, if you want to be a true Christian, you can't just go to church. You can't just have a cute, a cute little devotional. You read something, it impacts your life, then go and do it. Come on, bro. Go and obey the word. Come on, bro. If you don't, you're not a Christian. Mm. Well, I'm a believer. Okay, great. Jesus is talking to believers here, and he says, you want to be a true Christian? Obey. That's right. yeah. Obey. Yeah. Come on, she had to actually do what the Bible says to actually be a true convert mm. to the God of Israel. The Apostle Paul knew this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, This is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed. I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. To know and to trust that God is with you in the very place you find yourself today allows you to go on while experiencing his providential care in the midst of no matter what's going on. We not only see here the idea to trust God and do what God has provided as a way for her to take care of herself and her mother law but also we see that she was a very hard worker. Check it out. Back to Ruth, chapter 2. Look here in verse 6. Compare this to your workday. The overseer replied, she is a Moabite, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, she is a Moabite, who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from what? Morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Besides a quick break to chat with Boaz and a lunch, she got back at it. Chapter 2, verse 15. She got up to glean. Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her, even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. So she's gleaning from morning until evening. But was she done? No, next sentence. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She gleaned in the fields. She got to work turning the grain into meal, or separating the grain from the heads. She didn't stop working until the job was done. And again, God blessed her with over 30 pounds of grain. A max of 47. People kind of are back and forth as to how this worked out. But definitely, it was at least 30, could have been even closer to 50 pounds of grain. Just from gleaning. Because I can almost guarantee you, as awesome as Boaz was, I'm sure his guys weren't like grabbing fistfuls of stuff out of the stocks and just dropping it on the ground. But what again, what do you see? God provided. God provided in a great way. My brothers and sisters, are you known as a hard worker? Do you work until the job is done? Or do you just nibble at the task here and there and make excuses as to why it's not done yet? That was not Ruth's character. Now, lest you think that this was just a day trip, look at this. Ruth 2, verse 23. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. The barley and wheat harvests spanned between two and three months. So she didn't, like, show up to Boaz, got 30 pounds of grain, and then was like, out, sweet, we're good. And then I'm just going to live off the surplus and, oh, we're down again. I'm going to go back. No. She got to work and she stayed working for two to three months of this harvest. Ruth could have become selfish, having hit the jackpot of sorts and 
just kept it all for herself. We even read that even some of the lunch that she had, she had what she filled herself with, and then she kept some left over. And we read that she even took that back and gave it to Naomi. We read that in verse 18. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth, Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. No wonder her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed is this guy who took notice of you. You know, I believe she loved God with a whole heart, and that allowed her to return and care for Naomi day after day after day. And I believe that Ruth wanted to show Naomi that God was still with them, that indeed the curse was lifted. I mean, think about this. You've got a bitter old woman that's chilling in the house. She took on the responsibility of being the faithful one. She took on the responsibility. Baby Christian, she t- I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. I'm going to be faithful to God's word. I'm going to go work for, for God here. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And she brings it back. Hey, look at what I've got. Look at where I went. Look at what God's doing, Naomi. Showing the same kindness that Naomi showed to her early in chapter 1. Ruth had a deep care for others. What about you? Chapter 2, verse 10, if you go back a little bit, it says that this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found favor, such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? You know, there's something important to remember about Ruth here. Ruth knew that she would not be received well in this new land on account of her heritage and her family line. But she was willing to risk a chance for God. You know, the average person does not understand what it means to be in need and fails to appreciate the grace of God. Ruth fell on her face to demonstrate the great act of humility and respect for the kindness shown to her by Boaz. I don't deserve this. We talked about the prodigal daughter of Naomi coming back to God last week. This is also a prodigal daughter of God coming back. She was hurting inside. She was hungry and alone. And this act of care and compassion was too much. And she fell to the ground in a hundred percent humility. First Peter chapter 3, verse 3 says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as the elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Who do you dress to impress? Who do you dress to impress? Do you dress to impress the cute boy or girl in, on campus? Do you dress to impress the, the, the good-looking guy or gal at, at work? Do you dress to impress whoever, you know, maybe I might find a, somebody coming to church? Or do you dress to impress God, which is more on the inside than it is on the outside? Yeah. Nothing wrong with looking good. I told you guys a long time ago that I was grateful for coming back inside for our services because yeah. the, there's just something about a dude putting on a suit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something about it. But it's more important to God that I look good on the inside than on the outside. Are we a humble people? Or has the world crept into our hearts and seared the humility that we once had? Have we become prideful, arrogant, and entitled? You know, I'm afraid that too many of us would have responded knowing that he was a kinsman redeemer, that, hey, I'm a relative by marriage and by law. You let me glean here. You've got to let me. Or maybe, hey, you can't tell me where to glean and where not to. I'll do what I please. Oh, dear. Or, hey, I, I, I'm poor. You, you owe me, you wealthy snob. Oh, man. Keep in mind, the heart that Ruth is modeling for us is what we should be. Yeah. She is here in the scriptures not for some nice story to tell, but her life is for our learning. We have spent any time down on our faces as of late in a posture of complete humility before God for what he's given you? Or do we stand around and pray expecting to get what God owes us? Well, I've done this. I've done that. You know, oftentimes we give special missions and a lot of us can go, well, I, I blew up my goal. God should give me blah, blah, blah. No. 
God doesn't have to do anything. You got breath. That should be enough. But oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's not. And this is why the American church has such a hard time. Because we're so wealthy. Even the poorest amongst us is so wealthy in comparison to our family of churches all over the world and people all over the world. If not, we need to get back to a time when you said Jesus is Lord. Was this not the point of confession and repentance that we finally understood that we were a foreigner to God? We were a foreigner to God's grace. We did not deserve the kindness. God took notice of us. And in taking notice of us, drew us with cords of human kindness by the brothers and sisters who were around us, who studied the Bible with us, who showed us who God was, who showed us what God wanted us to do. We need to get back to that. We need to get back to that. Author Evan Balt says, Human arrogance and pride and the desire for self-determination often block those words from our lips and our hearts and our minds. The words, Jesus is Lord. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, we have a lot to learn from Ruth. Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, she is known as a woman of noble character. Where is that phrase used elsewhere in the Bible? Go to Proverbs 31. Ruth was called a woman of noble character, something that not only the sisters should aspire to be, but all of us, men and women of noble character. You know, most of the book of Proverbs was written by a guy named Solomon, who happened to be the son of a guy named David, who happened to be the son of a guy named uh, Jesse, who happened to be the son of a guy named Obed, who happened to be the son of a guy named Boaz, whose mother was Ruth. And again, just like how maybe David looked back in time at his great-great-grandfather Boaz to see this, the Lord bless you. No, the Lord be with you. Maybe we can look back in time and see Solomon looking back at his great-great-great-grandmother, Ruth. Proverbs 31, starting here in verse 10, says, A wife of noble character who can find. You could even take wife out and put woman. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her own earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. And you can read on and see this woman of noble character. But where is the hand of God in all of this? If you have spiritual eyes, you're seeing it all over the place. We've looked a little deeper at the character of our leading lady, Ruth. We've added our leading man in the story of Boaz. And I see that he's quite an addition. But what does any of this have to do with the godly hand in the daily grind? You know, it's interesting that we serve a God who can move mountains, who can raise people from the dead, who can heal the sick and the lame, who can give sight to the blind, provide miraculous healings, and raise his own son from the dead. Yet, I think oftentimes we can see those as great stories. We see the Bible as a book of exceptions rather than a book of examples of what God can do. The word coincidence is a small miracle, if I put a biblical spin to it, a small miracle where God prefers to remain anonymous. We've looked at Ruth 1.22, where it just so happened that they came back during the barley harvest. We see in Ruth 2 verse 1, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side named Boaz, And again, if you read that in and of itself, we can kind of just, okay, cool. But that word now has a connotation of and now, meaning it's a continuation of the story. It's a continuation of the thought. They came back during barley harvest, and it just so happens that the same barley harvest is this guy named Boaz. If you go to chapter 2, verse 3, 
So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in the field of Boaz. Again, this is, it just so happened. We can see that it's just an awesome coincidence. We can see that it's dumb luck. Hey, wouldn't you know it? Even Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, we see that man is our close relative. It's like Naomi had this epiphany. Wait a second. You, you just so happened. We just so happened to come back during the barley harvest. It just so happened that you went to glean in the sky Boaz's place. Boaz just happens to be a kinsman redeemer. We'll talk about that next week. It might not seem like words that would lead us to see the hand of God, but in light of what we've read in this chapter already, why introduce us to Boaz? Why have Ruth go glean in this field rather than others? I'm sure there was a lot of other fields around. Why have Boaz take such interest in Ruth if this was not a complete and total setup? This is what theologians call the providence of God. What is providence? Providence is exactly what the word says. Provide. It's God's provision. It's God coming into the details of our lives to provide for us. But here's what providence is not. Providence is not just a series of events in our life that may appear as luck or chance. Providence is not a Christian way of saying coincidence. You know, many of us would believe in fatalism. Fatalism is the view that all things are determined by an untouchable law of cause and effect. In other words, it's fate. Or deism, the idea that God created the world, but then withdrew from it day to day caring for it. He just wound the watch, set it down, and walked away. Or there's dualism. This is the view of two opposing forces in the universe are locked in a struggle with each other for control. This is good versus evil, right? This is God versus Satan. Let me just tell you something. Satan is a created being. God is not. There is no fight of good and evil. Good is already won. Good is already triumphed. That's the end of the story. Satan can do nothing. But the deists would have believed, again, that you've got the cosmos that just, and most of us, wake up in the morning as deists. Because we don't see God orchestrating the everyday purposes of our lives. Accept it or not, don't believe it, don't give credit, just, you know, God's not really interested in the everyday things of my life. That's not what the Bible says. The book of Ruth and the rest of the Bible has something different to say about the everyday events and circumstances that we happen to find ourselves in. Point number three is the hand of God. So what is providence? Christians believe that God in his providence interacts with the world and particularly the daily lives of his people. That he cares about life's daily events and does not abandon humanity. Mainly, providence means God is aware of what is happening in any given person's life. By his spirit, he is able to steer us, to move us, to clarify things for us, to motivate us to make decisions on a career or a marriage or any number of different things. And all of this somehow serves God's great purpose. We have the old coffee cup scripture, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Acts 17, we know this says, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. This is God's providence. God's hand in our everyday life, guiding us, molding us, shaping us to where he wants us to go so that what? We would have a choice. Well, wait, if God already knows everything, then where's the choice in that? Just because you know something doesn't mean you're causing something. Right? If I'm on top of a roof and I see an intersection and I see a car that's careening this way and a car that's careening that way, both of them are not interested in putting the brakes on, what can I see happening? A crash. Am I causing that crash to happen? No. I can just see it happening. But God is orchestrating the points and pieces of our lives for one purpose and one purpose only. He says God did this so that they would perhaps, meaning there's a choice. 
God is orchestrating the elements of our lives in order to give us the best opportunity to choose Him. God's hand is in the details and in the grand gestures as He paints the picture of our lives. This is called providence. Believing in providence means believing that God has big plans and small plans for this world. Big plans and small plans for this church and even for you. And he actively does things to see those plans come to fruition. You know, most people say that they can only sense God's guiding hand of providence in retrospect. And I believe that's true. We can go through things. I can look back at my life. Even why are Ariel and I going to Alaska? I could tell you horror stories where you would go, why in the world would you go back to Alaska? And yet, God allowed all those things to happen in our path for one reason and one reason only, so that we could go back there and plant a church. Come on. Sometimes what seems like random choice, say Ruth just happening upon a field of a farmer named Boaz, is seen in hindsight as God's hand moving the daily grind of our lives to achieve wonderful results. You know, today we can read Ruth's story and see all the connections that Ruth and Naomi could not have known for sure at the time. Ruth finds herself in Boaz's field. But to give you a little hint of what we'll get into over the next two weeks, Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, we read that this man is a kinsman redeemer or a guardian redeemer. That is the providence of God. Who knew? is an often phrase. Wow, who knew? We might be tempted to ask. Well, God did, and that's providence. That's the godly hand in the daily grind, my family. Don't ever, ever, ever second guess God's hand in your life. He desires to make something glorious out of your life. He wants to do good to you and not harm. You might be feeling harm. That's not God's. And the moment you turn and look to God, perhaps reach out and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. The moment you look at your life and you go, okay, God, this is crazy. I don't like it. I'm in in dire straits right now. Or even God, everything's awesome. Everything's going great right now. This is God's hand in your life. This is the godly hand in the daily grind. Amen? I love you all very, very much.